because this guy, Gail Sayers, was so fast. We'll see how it turns out. I'm a sports artist. So what that means to me is that if it moves, I'll paint it. So even though it's a static thing where the, you know, it's a piece of canvas and it's, you know, kind of two dimensional, it has to be three dimensional in my mind to get that player to move. Sports icons like Jerry Rice and Walter Payton hang from the walls in Bob Mueller's studio here in Nanaimo, looking as if they're ready to leap from the canvas into action. These striking paintings stem from Bob's passion for art and football that started at a very young age. It, it's the funniest thing is that nobody knows, including me, where that came from because my father doesn't like sports. He was living in Winnipeg as a little kid. Of all the hockey rinks and the pucks and birds and, and balls, why a football? I have no idea, but it was football and right from like this, I was fascinated by it. As a teen, Bob's love for the game grew. His family moved from Winnipeg to Victoria where he began playing football. It was then during a championship celebration where Bob watched an NFL film featuring the most feared man in football, Dick Butkiss. And here was this image of this guy smashing and crashing and I, I was like, I'd never seen anything like that. And in actual fact, it was that different that nobody else had seen anything like that. And when he hit people, they, they went down in a hurry. And I don't know, there's something magical about that. Inspired by the Chicago Bears linebacker, Bob began to draw, and with encouragement from his grade 9 art teacher, he spent most of his time sketching and selling pictures of sports athletes. After moving to high school, where his style of art was perceived more as a hobby, Bob quit art, and then football. And at the age of 16, he dropped out of school and didn't think about Dick Butkus for the next 35 years. And I had, uh, was teaching martial arts to literally thousands of people across the country. But it wasn't really my thing. I wound up in an odd place for me, which was in a yoga room. And what came from that was a sort of an emptiness, which I suppose is the yoga thing, right? You empty yourself. But I really had, and I let go of perhaps something I'd been carrying for a long time. And I wound up back home in Victoria, coming back from Los Angeles. Sitting at my computer, I typed in eBay. Well, when I typed in eBay, a little screen comes up, and I don't really know what it says, but I took it to say, what do you want? And I immediately thought, I'm interested in Dick Butkus. And that was it. I started buying stuff. Week after week, books, magazines, and other collectibles were delivered, and Bob would find himself immersed into the nostalgia of being a kid again. And then one day he discovered a photo he had had as a teen of the most feared man in football. This picture here is in the middle of this magazine. It's the centerfold. And I looked at that and went, I want to draw that. And I went down to the Opus art store and said, I used to be an artist. And I'd like to paint. It's a little embarrassing, but... <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have to start somewhere, you right? Start you know. Fourteen years later, Bob's paintings have transformed into a truly unique style of sport art, utilizing textures, color, and motion. I want the art to move. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of different things going on in the painting uh, that you only start to see when you get closer. And from a distance, you go, oh, yeah, that's a realistic-looking painting. Painting isn't the only skill that Bob developed over the years. He's also a motivational speaker, an Emmy Award winner, and most recently the author of Finding Your Butt Kiss, a playbook for success where he shares his unique story to inspire others to find their true purpose. If my dream was a guy named Dick Butkus, how silly could your dreams be? When you do something from your heart, when you do something you truly believe in, for me it was the art, then it led to, well, I want to tell other people about this. I want them to experience this joy that I had. It's already in there. How can you unlock it? How can you be that 15-year-old child and get that enthusiasm and then put it across in an adult manner? Then you people get excited because we're all kids at heart. Fish and Chips, the Adventure Cats. Fish is pretty crazy. Chips is sort of more a typical cat. We're the cat people. <laughs> One of my conditions for the cat was that 
the cat would have to come on adventures with us. We just try and keep doing what we like to do in our spare time, hiking and road trips, and now we just do it with cats. And you kind of see it through their eyes too. Like we go to a beach and it's the first time he's seen a beach and he's like, oh my God, it's a giant litter box. This is so exciting. Fish has come backpacking with us on the Wanda Fuca Trail. So they come in our sleeping bag with us and you get like this little like body warmer. When we went to Utah, that was their favorite place. All the rocks, it's like a giant cat tree. Just someone we were walking by said, hey, you should start an Instagram account for your cats. I don't have an Instagram account myself. It's crazy for us to think that people want to look at our cats every day. <laughs> I think that's a big part of it, inspiring other people to take their cats out. It's a, a weird thing, but it really shouldn't be a weird thing. What a good boy. They were having the Hacker Gal Hackathon, and it is the first time that we've done it in this school district. We've got about 28 girls that are in the computer lab here, and they are doing coding all day. Their teachers at the school have been doing a ton of work to get them ready for this and encourage them, and it's such a great program. We work on Scratch, and in Scratch you just kind of put the blocks together and then it's ready, but if you do it on like Codesters, then you have to like write out the code yourself. They are writing a program using a code uh, language called Python and they're going to create a game or a story that shows holiday cheer. It was confusing at first, but I got used to it. And you have to make it say what you want and you got to like really pay attention. There's a few things you have to remember like adding the quotation marks and the brackets, but other than that it's really simple. Hacker Gal is a non-profit based in Ontario and their, their uh, prime goal is to get more girls using code and using technology. Um, the reason for that is that right now only about 18% of degrees that are given in Canadian universities are given to girls in the subjects that go with the STEM initiative and STEM is science, technology, engineering and mathematics. It's fun because we have these really crazy ideas and it's hilarious. We're just doing a story so it's like page by page and there's no like sound or like real like button pushing but to make an app and stuff that's just crazy because it takes so long and so it's a big thought process. Not only uh, is it important for us to have girls uh, creating this stuff for other women but uh, right now there's going to be tons of jobs created in the tech industry and there's not enough students in the schools right now to fill them. It's so cool because like I never thought I could do something like that because I've never really had the chance to and so just seeing it was really cool. Most of the time it's like guys do it and they just assume that the guys do it but girls can do it like kind of better because they got like a more creative mind I think. But that, that's just my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really hoping that uh, we will be able to do the hackathon next year and in all of our schools. And I would love to see these girls do it again and build on what they already know and to have these girls become role models for other girls. There is no reason why girls can't code. I think girls are even better at it because they're so creative. And I would love to see more girls in our valley doing the coding with hopes that some of these girls, now that they understand it and they feel confident in it, may be more likely to choose this as a future career. Well done. I am so impressed. Thank you. Extreme sign. All right, now for some more extreme chemistry. What we got over here is we're gonna simulate crushing a can. All right, there we go. So what I've got over here is some water. I'm gonna bring it to a boil. And more specifically, I want this to be super, super, super hot. I want like steam coming out. I want this to be extreme. So we're gonna bring this to a boil. We're gonna have steam. This steam, as it forms inside, is gonna expand. It's gonna occupy a lot of space. And then what we're gonna do is something that's really crazy. We're gonna crush it. I'm not gonna crush it. Instead, this water is gonna crush it that we got over here. This is ice water, nothing more than that, just some ice water. So we got a lot of steam coming out. So we got a lot of vapor pushing out. I'm gonna turn this off, get this out of the way. I'm gonna grab this. And there we go. You wanna see that again? So what just happened was we had all that vapor, it expanded, pushed out. I put it inside this cold water. So what does that do? Cause all that vapor, which is out, to start contracting. 
which creates a vacuum. It's got two choices. When I put that can upside down, the opening inside the can can either pull the water up against gravity, which is really not going to do, or it can create the vacuum and crush the insides of the can, which is what it did super fast. That's pretty cool stuff. Have some tea. Thank you. Emu tea. I wanted to have a, a conversation with you when I heard about your Chinese menus and looking at the cultural significance of, of how Chinese people, when they came here, how they contributed to the makeup of Canada. There is meaning and understanding by looking at menus. My father and my uncle and my aunt's husband, they were all partners in the WK Gardens in Vancouver's Chinatown. So at one point in time, it was the place to dine in Chinatown. And, and back in the 40s, 50s, even in the early 60s, Chinatown was the happening place. There was dining and dancing. So if you look at some of those menus, they talk about dining and dancing. And the WK was very special. Of course, I'm biased, <laughs> being the daughter of uh, one of the operators, uh, there were very um, significant events that occurred at the WK Garden. So I, I actually remember having my father say, oh, well, you know, Prince Philip was here. Frank Sinatra was here. This menu that, that I have right here is special because it's in honor of Lester B. Pearson. So it says, Dinner in Honor of the Right Honorable L.B. Pearson, PCMP, Prime Minister of Canada, Friday, October 29th, 1965. And this is uh, quite significant because it's from the Eaton family. So of the Eaton's department store, and this is 1959. So very significant historically. I have a couple of items from the diner's rendezvous. So people who are from Nanaimo, Diner's Rendezvous, classic, right? This one uh, is interesting because it comes from Hotel Malaspina, mm -hmm. right? And so that's long, long gone. And it's dated 1968, and it says reserved for Mrs. Lee. What's interesting is that the menu clearly identifies it as being Chinese. They have, as the appetizer, emperor's combination, but they also have shark's fin soup. So again, that also tells you something about the trending of food. What is so important about these menus, that one main reason why you continue to collect them? I teach about food and culture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so that's one reason, mm -hmm. but it, it is a statement of history, right? So time and place. My menus, they're not completely scanned, but a good many of them, I would say the majority of them have been scanned. They are available for viewing on um, ViewSpace at VIU uh, through the library. So Imogene, I know you invited me to Ting Shang here in Nanaimo for a special reason. Why this restaurant? Well, one, it serves good food, but it also says something about Nanaimo's changing food scene, that you have a restaurant where it's not catering specifically to westernized tastes. So then this menu will one day be in your collection as well, right? Yes. <laughs> all right. There you have it, all about Chinese menus and how they made up part of the cultural fabric of Canada. Thanks for sharing all this with us, Imogene. And thank you for having me. A cup, a dish we likely use every day and don't think much of it. Why would we? It's just a cup. But for Chiro, creating these mugs helped save his life. I was really struggling with my identity and who I was and where I was going. And cups kind of like helped me figure out my direction. Chiro struggled with addiction. He was given an opportunity to uproot his life and move to Nanaimo to get clean. During his treatment, he began taking pottery classes at a local drop-in center. It was here that his love for ceramics was reignited. It really taught me that I needed to take better care of myself, that I needed to find a balance in my life, that making something functional uh, that contributes to other people's lives in a positive way is a great thing to do. 
Chiro changed his focus in school from business to a visual arts degree. Next year, he'll be starting his master's. My work has grown and my message has expanded from strictly making cups to making uh, ceramic art. As I look back at 33, at like what I did as a kid and why it took me so long to realize that, you know, this material is really important to me for whatever reason. And I may not even be able to describe it, but that the joy that it brings to my life and the sense of purpose. That purpose for Chiro is to foster community and connection through his artwork. In creating conversations and bringing people together and starting, you know, like conversations around maybe something that's uncomfortable. Chiro is starting a conversation about drug addiction through his art. He's recently been invited to an online national art exhibit, Liquids, Creams and Gels, hosted by the Gynocratic Art Gallery. His artwork will be displayed throughout February. So there's like me and this print, screen printed, holding a shield, kind of like fighting addiction. Um, so like fentanyl that comes in the form of um, prescription pills. It's something that we need to continue to talk about. And so I'm gonna keep making art about it because I see my friends dying and there's not really a lot I can do except for like personally stay clean and sober and um, inspire other people that they can change their lives. For Shaw TV, I'm Rayanne the Plant. Cruising down the island highway, I got nowhere to be. Is it one? Is it nine? Is it quarter to three? Understand I'm in no hurry, it's just not how I am. Gonna get my yoga on at the Colliery Dam. You see, I eat real slowly at a leisurely pace. Get my hair styled nice so that it's not in my face. But what I really want to tell you is don't make me hurry up. Gonna sit and watch the waves while I sip from my cup. Got all day to work on my rhymes. Be prepared, it can rain or snow anytime. Doesn't stress me out to be standing in line. Chilling by the beach and I'm sure feeling fine. I got Mondays for snowmen, I got Tuesdays for runs, and all the rest of the days I eat cinnamon buns. Yes, the island is amazing and I wish you were here. And you're never more than two minutes away from a deer. So please join me in relaxing while he tattoos my arm. And where else in the world is there a unicorn farm? You know, I'm never in a rush as you can see from this graphic. And I don't even get mad when I get stuck in traffic. Wait a minute. There's no traffic on the island. Traffic? What's traffic? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, look at that, it's a mime. Gotta walk a lot of steps going one at a time. Oh no, I forgot my next line. Don't just stand there, throw me a line. Archie, the bulldog, looks pretty cute in his protective goggles. He's not wearing them to make a fashion statement. He needs to wear the goggles during laser light therapy at the veterinarian's office. Archie is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, he came to me because he actually had an accident where he fell and he essentially got a stroke on his spinal cord. So he got the blood supply to his spinal cord cut off, basically. And what happened is he went acutely paralyzed in his back legs. Archie's initial prognosis wasn't good. Emergency doctors had even suggested euthanasia. However, once they discovered he hadn't broken his back and surgery wasn't needed, doctors suggested using physiotherapy to get him up walking again. 
any patient that has any kind of surgery, any orthopedic surgery, any nerve issues, any muscle strains, they go to physiotherapy. And we've just started to really introduce that in, in veterinary medicine, and it's a huge component of their recovery. I had no idea. No, I didn't know that was an option. I was excited. I thought that uh, definitely it would be something to look into and hopefully it would help the little guy out. Go, go, I keep going, keep going. The animal rehabilitation program starts with massage and therapeutic laser treatments. So the laser is a lower level light therapy that we use um, and it helps to stimulate healing, um, reduce pain and inflammation and we use that on most of our arthritis patients um, on their joints to help reduce the inflammation of their joints which in turn decreases pain and allows them to have more of a range of motion. Karma, a three-year-old golden Labrador retriever, has been going to rehab for the last year following surgery to her knees. We were out on a trail and she was running in front of me and she disappeared behind some trees and I heard a yip and she came back hobbling on all three legs, one up in the air. So I knew at that time it was probably the other cruciate ligament done. So, yeah. So, a big surgery again. Treats are used as motivation to get the dogs to respond to exercises tailored to their individual needs, like crawling through a series of movements on a mat, run a treadmill, or balance on large human exercise balls. Coming three days a week for just about a whole year, the benefits, um, she built muscle like crazy and I mean at first it was hard for her because of course new staff couldn't do the balancing in that but uh, she endured as well as the staff here endured with her and uh, yeah she built up the muscles really quickly and strengthened her body. She's got the most muscle I've ever seen in a dog before and she's so strong and is running on a treadmill and you never think a dog that had surgery in both of the knees would be able to do things like what she's doing in fitness. Now through the summer she can go swimming, so we swim her just about every day, yeah, plus walk, yeah, and she, we still do her therapy at home three days a week. Within a few weeks of rehabilitation treatments, Archie was on his feet again, but he had lost most of the muscle on his hind quarters and has had to work hard with his trainers and owners to regain his mobility. He's running on the beach for the first time and really we're just working on his balance a little bit more and, and strengthening both legs, but it's really a remarkable case. All dog lovers know that a dog isn't really a dog, it's basically, it's a part of your family. So going from what we had to deal with at the beginning to where he is now, it's hard to explain. You could tell he was really feeling it as well because he's such a cheerful dog. His personality is unbelievable and at the beginning he was so depressed. His head would hang down, he wouldn't look at you and now he's gaining all that muscle back with all the exercises we're doing here. His strength is coming back, his personality is back just like it was before so it's, um, it's an amazing feeling to see his, his progress. I wanted her to have a good quality of life, be able to hike with us and do things like that so it was very important to go through and do all this with her. When I first started, I was even skeptical. You know, you don't know until you see it. And then you see the difference that you can make in these patients' lives. And it's, I develop a very special bond with my rehab patients because you work with them one-on-one -on -one for so long and you see the progress they make and how it affects their family and their quality of life. It's really amazing and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Rehabilitation therapy can help dogs of any age live more comfortably and extend their quality of life. In Nanaimo, I'm Annette Lucas. My life is totally wrapped around my dog. Every day when I get up, it's planned out, chores on the side, where we're going to walk today, where we're going to train today, what we're going to do for fun. My name is Carol Toms and I'm part of the Canine Island Entertainments and we show our dogs at seniors homes for fun. The dogs love to dance, they love the music. I just love to watch my dog work. I love, love to watch his eyes light, light up when he's doing stuff that he enjoys. It's being a team, watching my dog have so much fun. You just 
um, want to share that with other people. When you see the faces of the people that are watching your work and you know, the, you just have to go back and do it again. And so that's, that is my life, it's my dog. I used to hate hockey when I was little. Olivia's friend would invite her over to play in net so he could practice his hockey skills. And I'd just stand in the net and I, I didn't like it. But after a while, she started to tolerate it, Good. then enjoy Good it, stairs. and now hockey is a huge That's part of her life. Now. Team Canada has been my goal since I, was, since I started hockey. Olivia is making that goal happen with the support of her mentor, Joshua Cook. Back in, out to the hair, back in, and then other side, so it's middle, right, left. Josh is a college hockey player for VIU Mariners and has played Junior A in international hockey for the past 12 years. Through his time traveling and staying with host families, he's made a lot of meaningful connections. I had a lot of people give me the opportunity to help my dreams become a reality and I felt like it was my, my duty to give back. Josh is paying it forward with his not-for-profit organization, Consistency Coaching, a completely free service for all minor hockey players ages 5 to 18. Josh is the goal-setting coach for the Oceanside Generals and currently mentors another dozen athletes. And it started off just being hockey specific, but it went into being um, helping pretty much anyone that, that wanted help through, you know, mentoring through life or, or goals. Um, so it's a 100% free service I offer to anyone that um, wants to better themselves not only as an athlete but as a person through such values as uh, commitment, honesty, compassion. These values are helping Olivia work towards her dream of wearing a medal for Team Canada. She was cut from her major midget team twice by the same, co uh, by the same team and then we set goals and, and uh, trained hard in the summer and, and she went and um, blew it out, absolutely blew the try out of the water and now she's one of the top goalies not only in this league but in Canada. He's really gotten me into goal setting, which is something was, that was never really a part of my life before this. Like I would set goals for my, like small goals for myself, but never really um, as specific as now, as since I've been working with him, he's really gotten me to set goals for every game rather than for a whole season in general. How do I miss you, a boy? He'll text me before my game on a Friday and he'll say, all right, Olivia, what are you going to do this game? What are you going to improve on? What are you going to do to help your team out? And what are you going to do to stay positive and keep your head up even if you get scored on? The reason I do this isn't for myself. It's 100% for, for my athletes and helping kids. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, uh, what everyone's got to realize is whether it's in sports or in hockey, everyone has the opportunity to make their dream become a reality. It just, it's the steps that they need to take to make that happen. Josh believes dreams don't work unless you do. Make sure you're giving the best you can, and that will always be enough. For Shaw TV, I'm Rianne LaPlante.